All right, so it is time for the lecture on disability this week. Um, before I start the lecture, I want to say that this is my first time recording the lecture in my apartment. So there is a very real possibility that my dog will decide that she needs to make herself heard. So um, don't be scared if randomly and seemingly without prompt you hear barking or if my cat comes and um, makes weird noises because she steps on a key. So I apologize in advance for that. But otherwise, let's jump right in to um, disability. So um, this week we're talking about chapter two from Elizabeth Barnes' book, The Minority Body. Um, before I get into that though, I wanna talk about a couple important reminders. Um, so first, if you haven't yet done your first analysis assignment, please remember that the first, um, the first one of the two that you have to do is due um, next Friday if you're doing it on disability. So if you want to do it um, to, on Tom Doherty's Sex, Lies, and Consent, that will be due this Friday. If you're doing it on the minority body, um, it will be due next Friday. However, if you haven't turned one in yet, you need to do it on one of those two. If you've already done one, no worries. Um, keep in mind though that you do have a second one coming up. You don't have to wait until after next Friday to turn one in. You can go ahead and do it on whatever you want. So if you haven't done the first analysis assignment, make sure you get one in either this Friday or next Friday. Great. Also, your exam is coming up. It will be available starting this Friday. However, I realize that the initial time I set it, so it was initially due on Tuesday, um, that doesn't give you very much time to complete it, especially given that we will have only just started talking about the minority body um, this week. And you may have a question on that on the exam. So, um, I'm pushing the deadline back from next Tuesday, which would have been April 7th, to next Friday, which is April 10th. I will have a study guide up for that um, later today. Um, so just be aware um, that that's coming up. You can take as much time as you need on this exam, as long as it is turned in by Friday, April 10th at 11.59 p.m. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Also, don't forget that I have office hours, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 11 through 12, um, in case you want to talk about any of the articles that we've covered or any of the stuff from earlier on in the semester. Okay, great. So that's the important reminders. Now let's move on to talking about the minority body. So this is a picture of Elizabeth Barnes. She is a professor at the University of Virginia um, in philosophy. She also does metaphysics of gender, so what it means to be a woman, um, what it means to have a gender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she also does metaphysics about other things as well. I'm less familiar with those works, um, but if you wanna hear more, I'm happy to talk with you about that. This comes from her book, her um, first book on disability. It's called The Minority Body. Um, in it, she defends a view of disability where disability is not something that is inherently bad for you. Um, it's merely another way of being a minority um, in our current society. It's a way of being different. And it's a way of being different that is stigmatized and otherized in our current society. Um, if you're interested in this chapter in particular, I especially recommend you read the rest of the book. Um, I am a big fan of Elizabeth Barnes, and I'm happy to talk more about her if you so desire. So moving on to this particular chapter, this particular chapter is called Bad Difference and Mere Difference. Um, it comes after the first chapter in which she motivates or provides reason for why um, it makes sense to ask, what is disability? Um, 
So all, the only thing you miss from chapter one is her motivating um, or really justifying the question she's going on to ask. So this is her first um, philosophical exploration into what it means to be disabled. The core question of this chapter um, is summarized on the second page of the, of the article that you have. And it is, is disability simply another way of being a minority, something that makes you different, but not something that makes you worse off? Or is disability something that's bad for you? Not merely something that makes you different, but something that makes you worse off because of that difference. I'm going to defend the view common within the disability rights movement, but often dismissed as incredible by philosophers, that disability is neutral with respect to well-being. So in this chapter, she's going to explain for us the difference between the bad difference and the mere difference views of disability. And she's going to hint at some reasons why she thinks we should accept the mere difference view. She's not going to get into a full defense of the mere difference view in this chapter that comes in her next chapter, but she does start to provide us reason for leaning that way. I want to mention before we get into the bulk of her argument that she is limiting her discussion to physical disabilities. She is not in this chapter talking about um, mental disabilities like mental illnesses or learning disabilities or cognitive disabilities. Um, she is doing so purposefully. She says that she has not given um, enough thought to whether or not her account should extend. We're going to talk more about that at the end of this lecture. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk about how she cashes out the bad difference and the mere difference views. The bad difference views, according to Barnes, is the is the belief or the um, view that not only is having a disability a bad thing, but having a disability would still be a bad thing even if society was fully accommodating of disabled people. Um, what she means by this is that the current world we live in um, is what she calls ableist. So by ableist, she means that society is not set up in a way to accommodate those with disabilities. We can think of the way that not all buildings are accessible by wheelchair. Um, we can think about how not all lectures um, have closed captioning for those who are hearing impaired. We can think about how not all books are available in Braille um, for those who are blind. If you want to get an idea of what this means, you can think of what the world would look like if every person was in a wheelchair. How would society be different? What ways would our building structures um, differ? Um, things like that. That's only one disability that we can recognize society is not set up to accommodate. She thinks that there are many different ways um, that society is ableist. So the bad difference view, again, um, is the belief that there is something inherent about disability, so not just in an ableist society, but because of a disability itself, that having a disability is a bad thing. This is common among the non-disabled public and um, the vast majority of philosophers, at least up until the last um, five or ten years. The mere difference view that Barnes is a proponent of has gained some traction in the philosophical literature, um, but it is still a less common view. Okay. She then talks about the mere difference view. Mere difference views are views that encapsulate the idea that having a disability is something that makes you physically non-standard but it doesn't by itself or automatically make you worse off. This is common within the disability rights movement. You may have heard of a social theory of disability. Um, she does not mean for the mere difference view to be synonymous with a social view of disability. So um, 
it's not important necessarily if you haven't heard of that. Um, but the social view of disability would be one way that a mere difference view would get cashed out. So if you think, um, um, if you think of the mere difference views as a set of views, the social view of philosophy would be a subset of that, but it doesn't completely capture all of the different ways you could be, um, you could hold a mere difference view of disability. Okay, so the bad difference view is that having a disability is a bad thing, even if society was fully accommodating of bad people, while the mere difference view is the idea that having a disability um, is something that makes you physically non-standard, but it doesn't inherently make you worse off. She starts by listing what the mere difference view does not say. So she wants to give a couple different misconceptions you might have about the mere difference view and explaining why you don't have to be, um, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? You don't necessarily have to accept these following statements just because you accept the mere difference view. So first, the mere difference view does not have to accept that disabled people aren't worse off than non-disabled people. That's a lot of negatives. What she's saying here is that someone who holds a mere difference view of society can still and um, rationally hold that on average disabled people are worse off than non-disabled people. What they're not going to do is say that disabled people are worse off than non-disabled people in virtue of their disability. She compares this with being gay. Um, most people have a mere difference view of homosexuality. So the idea that um, being gay isn't something that necessarily lowers your well-being or makes you worse off than someone who is not gay. Um, but gay people are on average less happy, they're more likely to experience depression, they're more likely to um, attempt suicide, not to say that every individual gay person is, but on average. Um, however, we don't think that's because they are gay, but because society is not set up in such a way that they are fully accepted um, in the same way as those who are not gay. So, um, the lowered well-being experienced by those who are gay, um, we think we can attribute that to being otherized, being stigmatized, and not being accepted. Um, she thinks that when it comes to disability, we can accept that on average, disabled people are less happy, are less able to pursue um, ends that they find valuable, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't have to accept that that is because they are disabled. Instead, we can think that perhaps it's because society is set up in the way that it currently is. Second, the mere difference view does not have to accept that disability doesn't involve the loss of intrinsic goods or capabilities. She thinks that, um, for example, when we talk about deafness, that hearing is an intrinsic good, or at least it can lead to intrinsic goods such as hearing music. In order to accept a mere difference view, you can accept that intrinsic goods may, may be or necessarily are lost when it comes to disabilities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to accept that being disabled is overall worse off. She asks us to think about the ability um, to create a new life um, inside of you and basically be pregnant. She had a cool way of saying it. Hold on, let me find it. Yeah, so she says... Um, um, we also think that the ability to be pregnant and give birth to grow a new person in your own body is an intrinsic good. As abilities go, it's certainly an impressive one. Um, but 
we know that those who are male are not able to do this, right? We think that pregnancy is an intrinsic good that those with a male body um, don't have. But we don't think that being male, because of this lack of an intrinsic good or capability, um, is worse off. Not only because they have other talents or abilities that somehow compensate, that's not the case, just that being male is different than being female and able to um, get pregnant, um, and that being male is not inherently worse. Similarly, we might think again that hearing or things that come along with hearing, such as hearing music, is an intrinsic good. But um, it's not just or it's not merely the loss of that ability. Um, we also, like she says, get other um, ways of experiencing the world. So for example, she says, being deaf is not simply the lack of the ability to hear. There are other goods, perhaps other intrinsic goods. For example, the unique experiences of language had by those whose first language is assigned rather than spoken language, the experience of music via vibrations, etc., experienced by deaf people and not by hearing people. Deafness can involve the lack of an intrinsic good without being merely the lack of an intrinsic good. It's not the case that these capabilities or experiences had by deaf people somehow compensate for the loss of hearing, but instead is just another way of experiencing the world that is neutral with respect to well-being. Um, so just like the male body can't get pregnant but has other ways of experiencing the world, those with disabilities have other ways of experiencing the world, but they're not necessarily worse off. Okay, so the idea behind the bad difference view is that there is a necessary connection between disability and lowered well-being. So the idea is that being disabled necessarily and in virtue of having a disability lowers your well-being. Well, based on what concept of well-being you're using, this could get cashed out in a couple different ways. She offers four different options for how this might get cashed out. Um, she explains four different ways that you might hold a bad difference view. She recognizes that these might not be all of the different ways to hold a bad difference view, but she thinks that for the vast majority of people with a bad difference view, um, they can be able to identify their view within one of these four options. Um, so first, it might be that disability is something that is an automatic or intrinsic cost to your well-being. Two, worse by <laughs> Yep, hold on. There's the... Uh, Cheyenne, hush. Cheyenne, hush. I'm very sorry. She's going to say... Um, okay, so we should be able to start again. Cheyenne, hush. Were society fully accepted of disabled people, it would still be the case that for any given disabled person, X, and any arbitrary non-disabled person, Y, such that X and Y are in relevantly similar personal and socioeconomic circumstances, it is likely that Y has a higher level of well-being in virtue of X's disability. Three, for any arbitrary disabled person, X, if you could hold X's personal and socioeconomic circumstances fixed, but remove their disability, you would thereby improve their well-being. And lastly, consider two possible worlds, world W and world W star, which are relevantly similar to the actual world, except that world W contains Cheyenne, hush. Sorry. 
which are relevantly similar to the actual world, except that world W contains no ableism, and world W contains both no ableism and no disabled people. The overall level of well-being in W in virtue of the fact that W star contains no disabled people is higher, is what that's supposed to say. My bad, I just completely forgot the, re the rest of that sentence. So I'll update that before I put this on Canvas. Um, okay, she has a couple different responses to these four different ways um, that the bad difference view might be cashed out. First, when we think about um, option one, that disability is something that is an automatic or intrinsic cost to your well-being, she says that this relies on the idea that there is objectively a best way to flourish as a human. Um, so that there's one way that maximizes your ability um, to enjoy life and flourish, so pursue valuable goods, um, have valuable relationships, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that disability is something that um, prevents us from achieving that, or is a hindrance to per, per, um, achieving that. Barnes thinks, however, that there's no necessary reason why um, disability has to conflict with an objective um, view of well-being or human flourishing, um, or at least not one that she's found so far. So one can believe that there is an objectively best way to be a person without accepting that disability um, hinders your ability to get there. Second, you might think that there is no necessarily one good way of human flourishing. Um, there might be different ways um, in which you can live your life and still maximize your well-being. Um, for example, um, some people might be able to maximize well-being by being an artist, whereas some people might maximize their well-being um, being a mathematician, something like that. Neither are wrong. Um, they're both able to um, maximize their well-being and flourish. So to summarize her response to this one, she says, there hasn't been a good enough reason given to suggest that disability necessarily hinders um, the pursuit of a, an objectively good life. Okay. Second. Cheyenne, hush. That should be the last time she barks. Okay. Second. Were society fully accepting of disabled people, it would still be the case that for any given disabled person X and any arbitrary non-disabled person Y, such that X and Y are in relevantly similar personal and socioeconomic circumstances, it is likely that Y has a higher level of well-being in virtue of X's disability. Her response to this is that as stated, um, when it says it's likely that Y has a higher level of well-being in virtue of X's disability, um, um, hold on, hold on, hold on, I lost my notes. Okay, sorry. So she was saying it's not just the point that um, a non-arbitrary um, or any arbitrary non-disabled person and a disabled person, um, that the non-disabled person is likelier to have a higher level of well-being. It has to be because of um, the disability. She thinks that it's going to be very hard to be able to determine if someone's well-being is lowered um, specifically because of the um, disability. However, she thinks that this might be one way in which the bad difference view can be cashed out. Um, this is one of the options that she finds most promising when it comes to the bad difference view. She addresses this more in chapter three. Um, 
So we're going to move on to number three. So for any arbitrary disabled person X, if you could hold X's personal and socioeconomic circumstances fixed, but remove their disability, you would thereby improve their well-being. So for any person, um, if you could hold their relationships, their job, their economic status, et cetera, et cetera, um, the same, but take away their disability or put them in a non-disabled body, you would thereby improve their well-being. Um, Barnes' response to this Barnes' response to this, um, this view is that it's unclear if it's even possible to hold all facts about a person's life um, steady while removing their disability. She thinks that this minimizes disability to a mere medical condition when, in fact, disability, um, at least in some sense, um, functions as a social identity, so it impacts um, the groups we find ourselves in, the opportunities we have, um, the things we choose to pursue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's unclear what it would look like um, to hold fixed someone's personal and socioeconomic circumstances while removing their disability. Lastly, she says consider two possible worlds, world W and W star, which are relevantly similar to the actual world, except that W contains no ableism and W star contains both no ableism and no disabled people. The overall level of well-being in W, in virtue of the fact um, that W star contains no disabled people, um, will be lower. So the overall level of well-being will be lower in world W than in W star in virtue of the fact that W star contains no disabled people, um, even though both worlds contain no ableism. Barnes's response to this is there might be many different reasons why this is the case. Um, for example, we know that a lot of things we thought which may, might cause disability, such as natural disasters, um, and accidents are also going to lower well-being. So if by removing um, the option of there being disabled people, we might also get rid of the opportunity, the, um, we might also get rid of things like natural disasters um, or accidents. It might be the case that um, World W star does have a higher level of well-being. Um, but it's unclear if that's necessarily because um, there is no disability. Instead, it might be because there are no things that cause disability or no negative consequences of having a disability. Okay, so what she's done in this section is she describes four different ways that you might hold a bad difference view. For most of them, she's given us some reason to think that they might not be um, the best way of cashing out um, a theory of disability. However, she hasn't given a full, um, a full argument against any of them individually. She's given us um, a foundation upon which to build our own um, view. In the next chapter, and if you're interested, I'm happy to provide it, um, she goes on to explain why she thinks that these ultimately fail. Um, but if you find yourself with a bad difference view, she thinks that you ought to be able to identify with one of these different ways of um, cashing that out. Okay, so um, the mere differences view, as we've mentioned before, um, is that disability is neutral with respect to well-being. It's not inherently better or worse with respect to well-being. Um, she thinks it's important to mention that it's not inherently better um, just because we have what she calls the Magneto view, I think is what she calls it, um, which is that 
being disabled is something which makes you better off. However, she says that she doesn't know of anyone who's actually defended such a view except for Magneto and he's fictional. Um, but it's important if you accept a mere difference view um, that you don't think that disability is something that's inherently better or inherently worse. The mere difference view is typically associated with phrases such as disability is analogous to features like sexuality, gender, ethnicity, and race. Um, in other words, that they are identities that we have that make us different from other people but do not necessarily make us better or worse off inherently. Two, disability is not a defect or a departure from quote, normal functioning. Three, that diversity is a valuable part of human diversity that should be celebrated and preserved. And four, that a principal source of the bad effects of disability is society's treatment of disabled people rather than disability itself. These are um, four different ways that holding a mere difference view can get cashed out. Um, so if you find yourself um, aligning with a mere difference view, it's going to be something like this. It's important to remember to remember that the mere difference view isn't just um, disagreeing with the bad difference view. It's instead holding the positive view that disability is neutral with respect to well-being. I think the way I phrased that might have been confusing. What she means is that the, holding a mere difference view doesn't just mean disability isn't inherently bad. It's specifically the view that disability is neutral with respect to well-being. But perhaps you think something like this, but it's just obvious that disability is a bad thing. She thinks that this is what drives the intuitive, um, quote unquote, intuitive, um, response of the non-disabled public and philosophers when they adopt something like the bad difference view. Um, she thinks that it's just obvious that being disabled is a bad thing. However, she thinks that there are a couple different, um, there, she has two different responses to this. Um, first, she brings up the empirical response, which is that Given the empirical data we have, it's not as obvious that being disabled necessarily lowers your well-being. Um, so we have um, data to suggest that um, non-disabled people are extraordinarily bad at predict predicting the effects of disability on perceived well-being. Um, Non-disabled people tend to assume that disability will have substantial negative effects on perceived well-being and that the perceived well-being of the disabled will be substantially lower than their own. Um, but a substantial amount of research suggests that this is simply not the case. Um, the non-disabled appear to be bad at predicting the impact of disability on the disabled and tend to systematically overestimate the bad effects of disability on perceived well-being and happiness. What this empirical information shows um, is obviously not cut and dry what it means, um, but it does suggest that what the non-disabled public thinks is obvious about the connection between disability and well-being um, isn't as obvious as it might first appear. Um, we have reason to doubt it, and just because it's intuitive um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's justified. Second, she offers a philosophical response. Um, and I want to quote this because um, I think it's really, really good the way she says it. Ah, okay. Um, the claim that it is simply obvious that disability is bad difference is, I take it, an intuition. More to the point, it's an intuition about something that is a subject of prejudice and stigma. 
But if we have good reason to believe that disability is the subject of prejudice and stigma, then it seems we also have good reason to think our intuitions about disability aren't going to be particularly reliable and aren't going to be a good groundwork on which to construct a theory of disability, especially if that means favoring the intuitions of the non-disabled over the testimony of the disabled. What she means here is that given the negative associations we have societally um, with disability, we should be wary about any sort of intuition we have about it. Our intuitions are tainted by um, a society that otherizes and stigmatizes the disabled, and therefore we should be wary of accepting um, these intuitions, especially when they seem to conflict with the testimony of individuals who are disabled. We have, we have reason to believe that she's right here, given the ways in which our intuitions in the past um, have been tainted based on um, societal norms. So she mentions Hume, who we have here on the left, and Kant, who we have here on the right. Um, Hume says some pretty shitty things um, about non-white races that he thought were obvious. He ends by saying there never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even in the, any individual eminent either in action or speculation. He thinks that it is obviously intuitive that um, the white race is um, superior than all of the other races, but we should doubt this intuition given the racism in human society, right? And we, in fact, know that Hume was wrong. Similarly, Kant says some shitty things about women. Um, the quotes that Barnes highlights, um, she says that, quoting Kant, women use their books somewhat like a watch. That is, they wear it so it can be noticed that they have one, although it is usually broken or does not show the correct time. Second, a woman who has a head full of Greek or carries on fundamental controversies about mechanics might as well even have a beard, for that would express more obviously the mien of profundity for which she strives. So um, it's obvious to Kant that women are not capable of intellectual pursuits. Um, they aren't cut out for um, thinking big thoughts. Um, Based on his other works, you can see that uh, they're pretty much just good for sleeping with. Um, and that's obviously intuitive to Kant, but we should be wary of accepting this intuition, given that he lived in a society that was tainted with pretty significant sexism. Similarly, in our own society, uh, we, we have some unconscious or deeply ingrained associations um, with disability. So we should probably be wary about just accepting or thinking our intuitions justify a theory of disability. Good. But maybe it's just not, it's not just that we think disability is necessarily bad, it's that we think that shortened lifespan and chronic pain that are associated with disability is not inherently bad. Again, Barnes has a couple different responses to this. First, she starts um, by saying that, con that the connection between these things and decreased well-being isn't as obvious as it seems bad. So we know that being, ma being a man uh, is associated with a shortened lifespan than being a woman. Um, but we don't think that being a man is um, inherently worse than being, than being a woman. I'm sorry, a wasp just flew into my window and that was terrifying. Um, trying to figure out how to get that out. Um, I might put my cat on that. Okay, sorry. Um, distracted, coming back, coming back. Um, so um, if we want to say something like shortened lifespan, um, it makes a condition or a way of being necessarily worse. Um, we'd have to specify how much of a shortened lifespan makes something inherently worse um, if we want to differentiate that from just being a man versus being a woman. Um, and it's unclear what that threshold would be. Second, when we talk about chronic pain, she brings up more um, empirical studies that suggest 
um, that well-being in cases of chronic pain um, don't map on the way that we might think intuitively. So um, those with chronic pain um, don't tend to be as worse off as those without chronic pain might expect. Um, in fact, what seems to be the determiner um, of a person's well-being is their, um, what, how did she say it? Um, is their pers, oh, I lost it. Um, is their mindset and their response to that pain. So what she's saying here is not that pain isn't a bad thing um, or that those with chronic pain can just get over it if they have a good mindset. Um, instead, we should think that it isn't necessarily the case that those with chronic pain are overall living a worse life. Um, she ends that section by saying, the assumption that physical pain is neatly and directly correlated with reduction in well-being is a crude oversimplification. But even assuming um, that shortened lifespan and chronic pain are bad things, so even if we just accept that, yeah, um, shortened lifespan is bad and chronic pain is bad, we can distinguish between disability and different aspects of the disability. So, to quote Barnes, we can manta maintain that disability is mere difference without maintaining that everything about disability is perfectly fine and shouldn't be ameliorated. To highlight what she means here, she draws a distinction between this discussion of disability and the discussion of gender in Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Um, in this book, um, it can be read as Mary Wollstonecraft defending something like a mere difference view of being a woman, that it's not necessarily worse than being a man. However, she recognizes that there are parts or aspects of being a woman um, that are bad or that should be fixed. So she talks about um, the extreme pain, disastrous side effects, um, and high mortality rate associated with childbirth um, at the time. Um, we can recognize that these are bad things about being in a female body. Um, I was saying woman, I apologize, I thought she was talking about being, um, yeah, so she's defending a mere difference view of both the gender woman and the female sex. Um, she can recognize that there are parts of this experience that are inherently bad that we should aim to fix. So we can say um, something like being in a female body or being a woman isn't inherently worse than being a man while still accepting that we should be actively working towards conditions um, that make that experience better. So limiting the pain um, and high mortality rate associated with childbirth um, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to accept that being a woman or being in a female body is bad or worse than being um, a man or in a male body. Um, to just drive this point home, um, Barnes says, moreover, Wollstonecraft's position doesn't seem threatened by the prospect that some bad features of being a woman or being female are simply ineliminable. It's consistent with a mere difference view of being female that there will be inevitably be some bad things about being female. Um, similarly, we can think that there might be bad things um, associated with a disability, um, perhaps in this case a shortened lifespan and chronic pain, but that doesn't necessarily mean that being disabled is overall inherently worse for us. Okay, um, so to summarize what Barnes has done in this chapter is she examines the mere difference and bad difference views of disability. Um, to reiterate, the bad difference view is the idea that disability is inherently bad and that it would still be bad even if our society wasn't ableist, whereas the mere difference view is the idea that, gen that disability is neutral with respect to well-being, similarly to the way we might think of gender or race. Um, we can still recognize 
that it might have bad aspects like shortened lifespan or chronic pain or is overall bad currently given an ableist society in the same way we can recognize um, that um, as she mentioned in the beginning, being gay is associated with overall lower well-being given that we live in a homophobic society. She hints at reasons for accepting the mere difference view um, by drawing on analogies between homosexuality, um, being pregnant, and being a woman. Um, but she hasn't given a full-blown defense here. If you're more interested in her full-blown defense, I am happy to talk further with you about that. Um, but I'm mostly going to leave this discussion for the discussion board. I want to hear if you, um, or where you tend to find yourself when it comes to this distinction between the mere difference and bad difference view of disability. Some questions to think about in addition to where you find yourself. Um, are, well, that first one is, where do you find yourself? And the second one is, Barnes limits her discussion to physical disabilities. Do you think her account does or should extend to mental and cognitive disabilities? So for example, if um, you are convinced that we should hold a mere difference view of disability um, with regards to physical disabilities, should that extend to mental and cognitive disabilities? If not, um, what is the distinguishing factor? Um, so what makes physical disabilities um, relevantly different from mental and cognitive disabilities? Okay, so I will leave those questions for the discussion boards. Please continue engaging in those. Um, coming up, please don't forget, that you need to complete your first analysis assignment if you haven't already. Um, you either need to turn one in this Friday, um, so April 3rd, if you are doing one on sex, lies, and consent, or next Friday, April 10th, if you're doing one on disability. Um, the exam is also coming up. That will open up this Friday and will be available um, for a week. It will be due next Friday at, um, at 11.59, so April 10th at 11.59. I will have a study guide up sometime today um, if you want to know what to study. Um, I do think that you'll have plenty of time um, to complete it even if you don't look at, at it until Friday. Um, for next week, we'll be starting our section on political philosophy, um, so please read um, Harry Frankfurt's On Bullshit. This is a really fun article. I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, yeah, so thank you, and I will fix, this fix these slides, put them up, um, and load this lecture onto Canvas. Okay, um, I hope everyone is staying safe, staying healthy. Um, have a great rest of your Monday.